Broadcasting live from a secret location buried deep below the earth, you're about to make a connection to the signs of the times. W. Dean Shook is live on the air right now. You have just tuned in to the new mainstream media in time news, and I'm your host, W. Dean Shook. Bring you the news that the establishment media refuses to touch. We are going to have a lively discussion today. And I can already see my email is going to just bog down with everything that's going to come from this program. Because I'm going to say a lot of things that a lot of people are really not going to like. But we're going to let the truth reign. I'm your host, W. D. Shook. Welcome to all of our listeners on the iHeartRadio Network the Spreaker Radio Network, the Blog Talk Radio Network, our regular broadcast affiliates across this country. Welcome to everyone. Please feel free to participate. Send me an email if you like. It's wdeanshook.com. It's a website and email is contact at wdeanshook.com. Just write it down and have it ready because I'm sure you're going to be cussing me up one side and right down the other by the end of this program. And I'm ready for that because, I'm, like I said, I'm going to let the truth reign. But before we start our discussion about uh, whether Marco Rubio is an anchor baby, I want to give you a few headlines. Uh, And I'm not going to talk too much about the stock market. Uh, I've been warning you for a couple of months. I hope that uh, you've all been smart enough to prepare yourself for what's coming. Um, You've had a couple months notice. If you're a regular listener, you've heard me talk about this for quite a while. So there's still time to go out there and you know store up some food and some water and be ready for this. All right. So let's start with the news of the day, and then we're going to talk about uh, Mr. Rubio. I want to start with something from the Washington Free Beacon. It seems that the DHS has kept secret the release of violent criminal illegals. Well, the Obama administration officials have began notifying local law enforcement officials of the release of violent criminal illegal immigrants within the last two weeks. Well, according to Arizona law enforcement officials who say they have for years been kept in the dark about the release of illegal immigrants back into their towns, the public disclosure of this practice in which Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, frees criminal illegal immigrants back into U.S. communities. This came to light earlier this week when Arizona law enforcement was made aware that three illegal aliens with violent criminal records had been released back into their streets. Law enforcement officials and members of Congress have expressed outrage over the practice they've petitioned DHS in recent days to end a policy described as catch and release. At least three illegal aliens released by DHS in recent weeks have been charged with serious crimes, including the beating of a seven-week-old baby, according to local law enforcement and Representative Matt Salmon. Republican from Arizona and other Arizona law enforcement officials in Maricopa County Sheriff's Office further disclosed at the Free Beacon that 
They're still being kept in the dark about these releases and question whether DHS has implemented a standard nationwide practice to alert local offices. Solomon said, When I heard it, there isn't a requirement for DHS to inform local law enforcement agencies about the imminent release of illegal criminal aliens, I was shocked. In a post-9-11 world, he said, where the constant sharing of information between agencies is commonplace, even sometimes at the expense of our rights, this is unacceptable. Simply put, if DHS insists on releasing dangerous illegal aliens into our neighborhoods, The public and law enforcement need to know about it. He said, I'm now working to amend existing law to require that local agencies be notified by DHS before illegal aliens with violent criminal records are released back into our streets. American citizens deserve to know who our federal government is forcing out into the streets and permitting them to victimize our families. He says, I will not stop until we ensure that our local law enforcement agencies are given the tools they need to protect our communities. The release of violent, illegal immigrants has been taking place since at least 2013, when Pinell County Sheriff was informed by senior ICE officials that illegal immigrants were being released back into Arizona. Sources said he was livid. Well, if you're watching the upcoming election, how could the 2016 race for the Oval Office get any crazier? Well, on the GOP side, there's a long list of experienced politicians with long lists of accomplishments to their names trying to become president, senior governors, senators, statesmen, and they're all trailing Donald Trump. We all know who Donald Trump is. He's a shoot-from-the-hip billionaire with a knack for saying what people across the country are feeling. Well, on the Democratic side... They're surging support for a self-avowed socialist who's challenging Hillary Clinton, who thought she was the anointed candidate in 2008, only to be knocked off of her pedestal by an upstart Barack Obama. She considers herself anointed now. She finds her support fading very quickly, though. So how about the gauntlet being thrown down by Michelle Obama? There's already some commenting on the idea. WND commentator Star Parker told WND she was at a book signing in Washington this week and was asked about the possibility. She admitted she's watching that possible development closely. She said, I've seen a number of stickers that say Michelle in 2016, Parker told WND, until the primaries are absolutely closed. My eye is on Michelle. Well, Washington columnist Edward Klein has reported that Michelle Obama's plans after her husband's presidency are big, and they don't necessarily include her husband. Seems for a while the First Lady played with the idea of running for Illinois' Senate seat now occupied by Republican Mark Kirk, who was hobbled by a 2012 stroke and recently fell during a vote on the Senate floor. But she has all but dismissed the idea, he reported. It was from an Illinois Senate seat, remember, that Barack Obama launched his successful bid for the Oval Office. But while describing how Michelle Obama envisions a future alongside her best friend and confidant Valerie Jarrett, he said she also doesn't want to step down from the luxurious Air Force One lifestyle. Some are even floating the idea of, get this, a Hillary Michelle ticket. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) And you didn't think it could get any weirder, did you? (laughs) My goodness. Well, it seems the Obama administration is furious. Well, why is that? Because Obama's secret side deals that he said would not be released to the public and was kept under lock and key so no one would see it has leaked out. According to the Times of Israel, Republicans fume as a secret deal that lets Iran inspect its own nuke sites. Remember now, John Kerry told us that we would inspect anytime, anywhere, and that we could inspect all sites and installations on demand. Well, Israel responded with a furious criticism Wednesday night to the news that Iran is allowed to conduct its own inspections of a site it allegedly used to develop nuclear arms. Well, in the U.S., Republican leaders also responded bitterly to the news, with a leading senator calling the agreement to have Iran inspect its own site remarkably naive and incredibly reckless. According to a document obtained by the Associated Press, an agreement worked out between the International Atomic Energy Agency 
and Iran allows the Islamic Republic to use its own experts to inspect the Parchin nuclear site. Well, the IAEA's concession is unprecedented, according to a former senior IAEA official. Iran has refused access to Parchin for years, based on U.S., Israeli, and other intelligence and its own research the IAEA suspects that the Islamic Republic may be experimenting with high-explosive detonators for nuclear arms at that military facility. The IAEA has reportedly cited evidence based on satellite images of possible attempts to sanitize the site since the alleged work stopped more than a decade ago. Well, while the White House declined to comment on the reported document, Israel's energy minister, Yuval Stentz, immediately issued a sarcastic response. He said, one must welcome this global innovation and outside-the-box thinking. He said in a statement dripping with sarcasm, one can only wonder if the Iranian inspectors will also have to wait the 24 days before being able to visit the site and look at incriminating evidence. <laughs> well, Stentz, the Israeli government's point man on Iran, was alluding to the complex clauses in the agreement reached last month between world powers and Iran aimed at curbing its nuclear program, one of which provides Iran with 24 days notice of efforts to inspect suspect sites. Well, Republican senators were also furious. This site agreement shows that true verification is a sham. It begs the question of what else the administration's keeping from Congress. This according to Representative Kevin McCarthy, the House Majority Leader. McCarthy also complained Congress learned of the IAEA deal from the AP report and not from the administration. John Cornyn of Texas, the second-ranking Republican senator, said trusting Iran to inspect its own nuclear site and report to the U.N. in an open and transparent way is remarkably naive, incredibly reckless. Well, this revelation only reinforces the deep-seated concern that the American people have about this agreement. The Republican chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Representative Ed Royce, called the agreement a dangerous farce and he accused the world powers who brokered the deal of acquiescing to Iran's every demand. International inspections should be done by international inspectors, period. The standard of anywhere, anytime inspections, so crucial to a viable agreement, has dropped to when Iran wants, where Iran wants, on Iran's terms. And for weeks, Congress has been demanding access to this document to access the viability of the inspection measures. Congress must now consider whether this unprecedented agreement will keep Iran from cheating. This is a dangerous farce. And Republican presidential hopeful Jeb Bush also used the term farce, writing Wednesday on Twitter that nuclear inspections of state sponsors of terrorism can't work on the honor system, well, at least Jeb got one thing right. Well, I'm going to take this uh, little short break here. But when I come back, we're going to talk about Mr. Marco Rubio. Because most of the liberal media are wearing tinfoil hats when it comes to knowledge of the Constitution. Therefore, they print false doctrine in just about every one of their stories. The bad things that are happening in America are happening because of violations of our Constitution. The liberal media lack of education on the Constitution is truly detrimental to America because most people believe this false doctrine that they spout. Well, when I come back from this break, we're going to talk about what it says in the Constitution, but I'm also going to talk about what the National Archives say about Marco Rubio and his citizenship. We'll be back right after this break. You're listening to a global pioneer in the new mainstream media. In Time News with W. Dean Shook, your connection to the signs of the times. to the right place. Why? I'll tell you why. 
Who can take your money? Who can take your money? With a twinkle in their eye. A twinkle in their eye. Take it all away and give it to some other guy. The government. The government. The government can. The government can. And who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the sunrise? Who can tax the trees? Who can tax the trees? Let your run. The government, the government, oh, the government can, the government can, and the government can, cause they mix it up with lies and make it all taste good. Make it all taste good. The government takes everything we make to pay for all of their solutions. Healthcare, climate change, pollution, throw away the Constitution. Fathers roll over in the grave. The government, the government, oh, the government can, the government can, and the government can, 'cause they mix it up well as they make it all taste good. Make it all taste good. The government takes everything we make. They're power hungry and malicious. Their economics are fictitious. Soon we'll have to eat. Our dishes. Mm, delicious. Oh, who can, who can be a failure? In so many ways. In so many ways. And instead of getting fired, hey, we'll give ourselves a raise. The government. Hi, folks. Have you noticed the federal government and police departments are using drones for everything? Drones are expensive. They're hard to fly. It can take up to a week just to learn to make a drone hover. Not anymore. There's a new generation of drones that are not only affordable but very easy to fly. Now you can have your own personal drone, anything from a micro mini that'll fit in the palm of your hand, right up to a full scale model, 10 inches in diameter, like the model I have. The V949 Pro comes with a six-axis four-rotor blade and an HD 2.4 camera mounted on the bottom. These drones are made of a space-age polymer. They're durable, and don't worry about crashing your drone. Replacement blades for this drone from the website are only a dollar eighty for a pack of four. That's right, I said a dollar eighty for a pack of four replacement blades. You can also get an extra long life battery. This battery allows you up to a half hour of fly time with a maximum speed of 40 miles an hour. Have your own personal drone, and you can get all of this for under seventy dollars if you go to the website wdeanshook.com and click on the banner on the web page. You can get from seven to twenty-two percent off your personal drone. It's shipped as a kit. You can be up and flying your own personal drone with an HD camera within a half hour. Come to the web page wdeanshook.com. Click on that banner and get your discount today. WDeanShook.com. We are living in unprecedented times. Constant wars worldwide, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. They're genetically modifying our food. Increased violence as the heart of man grows cold. Ever increasingly tyrannical governments around the world. Stay connected. End time prophecy news with W. Dean Shook. Your connection to the signs of the times. Do you think the media is biased? Maybe they're leaving something out, or there's something they're not telling you. Now you have a source for the truth in the news. W. Dean Shook. End time news. Your connection to the signs of the times. All right, kids. Let's let the games begin, and we're going to start with. 
From the National Archives data, Senator Marco Rubio's father was not a nationalized citizen when Marco Rubio was born in 1971. His father applied for nationalization, according to the archives, September of 1975. Marco Rubio is not constitutionally eligible to run for president or vice president. A natural-born citizen of the United States is one born in the United States to two U.S. citizens who were citizens of the United States either by birth or naturalization at the time of the birth of the child. A natural-born citizen of the United States is a child born with sole allegiance to the United States. A person born without citizenship in any other country other than the USA at the time of their birth. Now, a natural-born citizen has no foreign influence or claim on them by any other country at the time of their birth under U.S. law and the law of nations. This is why the founding fathers and the framers, whose legal term of the art of natural-born citizen for the eligibility clause for the singular most powerful office in our form of government, the president and commander-in-chief of our military. They didn't want the command of our military forces to ever devolve to a person born with dual allegiance. Now, Marco Rubio has been evasive and not forthcoming about his exact citizen status or about his birth in the United States since 1971. Phone calls, emails, and letters to his office by various volunteers over the last year have gone unanswered on the question of whether his parents, who were immigrants from Cuba, had become naturalized citizens of the U.S. by the time Marco Rubio was born in 1971. Now, we've given Rubio long enough to be voluntarily forthcoming on this information. Well, a phone call last week by a volunteer researcher assisting efforts to learn more about Rubio's exact birth citizenship status was made to the National Archives to learn more about the facts of Rubio and certain other individuals who are mentioned in the media as potential candidates for president or vice president. That is, are they constitutionally eligible? Natural-born citizens of the United States as required in Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, according to the information conveyed to the volunteer during those phone calls to become a naturalized citizen of the United States, according to the information conveyed to the volunteer during phone calls to the NARA about Marco Rubio's father, did not petition to become a nationalized citizen of the United States until September 1975 a full four years after Marco Rubio was born. Now, a natural-born citizen of the U.S. is one born in the United States to two U.S. citizens at the time of their birth. Marco Rubio is not a natural-born citizen of the United States. He's a native-born under the 14th Amendment, according to the Wong Kim Ark of 1898. That's a Supreme Court decision which grants basic citizenships to individuals born in the U.S. But Marco Rubio is not a natural-born citizen under Article 2, Section 1. So, Senator Marco Rubio is not constitutionally eligible to serve as president or vice president, according to Article 2, Section 1. And that's what it says in the last sentence of the Twelfth Amendment of the Constitution. Senator Rubio has obviously known this for a long time. His silence in response to the American people in answering the question to put him over the last year about his issue says a lot about Marco Rubio. It shows that when it comes to his own political personal objectives, he's in the progressive school of thought about following the fundamental law of the land, our U.S. Constitution. The people of the progressive school of thought say that the Constitution says whatever they want it to say, whatever they want it to mean, in order to allow their personal political power or gain. John McCain did that in 2008 in the presidential election cycle when he made a deal with Obama and the U.S. Senate so that McCain could run unmolested about questions by the Democratic Party operatives and their allies in the major media as to his natural-born citizenship status. The truth is, Senator Marco Rubio is not a natural-born citizen. He was born with dual allegiance. 
one to the U.S. by location of birth and the other to Cuba via gaining Cuban citizenship at birth via his father, since his father had not yet been naturalized to the U.S. and renounced his Cuban citizenship by doing so. This is similar to the situation with Obama, who gained Kenyan citizenship via his father, who was a Kenyan subject. Senator Rubio should stand up for the Constitution. He should speak about this and say that as much as he'd like to run someday for those offices, he's not constitutionally eligible to run for president or vice president. He should be a protector of the U.S. Constitution. The document that gave his parents the freedom and liberty that they sought when they came to this country, he should put his personal ambitions for higher office aside. He should tell the RNC and people in the media the facts and stand up like a statesman should and support the Constitution and not allow them to continue their musing and aspirations to running for president or VP someday. To allow these kind of decisions to continue in the major media is allowing them to continue to undermine the true meaning of intent of natural born citizen clause in Article 2 of the Constitution. And also... To clarify his own constitutional citizenship status, Rubio should also say that Obama is not eligible either and should be investigated for election fraud and criminal activities using a false social security number, draft registration, and be removed from office. We not only have an unconstitutionally ineligible person in the Oval Office right now, but the leadership of the Republican Party and the RNC is also complicit in this absurdion of the Founders and the Framers' intent with the Eligibility Clause in Article 2, Section 1. The Republican Party leadership has enabled Obama to get away with what he's done and has ignored the Constitution when it suits their own political objectives. It's time for a change in the Republican Party leadership to somebody who will actually defend the Constitution. We need dedicated constitutionalists to take over the party and fight for the righteous battle to restore the rule of law and the U.S. Constitution to full force and effect in Washington, D.C. and throughout America. They need to investigate Obama. They need to remove him for the fraud and criminal that he is and start a purge in Washington, D.C. of all of these enablers of this cover-up. And I think history is going to show that Obama has perpetrated the largest fraud in history on the American people. Now, we're going to go over the Constitution right now. And you're going to see where I get the audacity to say these things. It's in the Constitution. So some of you may have heard there's something called Vital's Law of Nation. The works in Vital's Law of Nations was used by the First and Second Continental Congress to form our Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Now we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So the question, is Marco Rubio a natural-born citizen within the meaning of Article 2 of the Constitution? Is he qualified to be president according to the media or according to the Constitution? Well, Brett Bauer asserts that Congress can define and presumably redefine from time to time terms in the Constitution by means of law. What does that mean? Well, Chet Arthur The American thinker, he says the original meaning of natural born citizen is determined by reference to the Heritage Guide to the Constitution and to the definitions of citizen in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868. Now, he claims human events say that anyone born within the United States is a natural born citizen and eligible to be president. And they stand behind that and say that's what the Constitution says. Well, Jake Walker, a red state, purports to show how the term has been used from 1795 to right now. After quoting James Madison on the citizenship requirements imposed by Article 1 to a member of the House. And Walker gleefully quotes 1795 decision of natural born subject to prove that anyone born here is a natural citizen. Because that's what it says, a natural born subject to prove that anyone here is born a natural citizen. Walker says it's an established maxim received by all political writers that every person owes a national allegiance to the government of the country in which he's born. Allegiance is defined to be a tie that binds the subject to the state. And in consequence of his obedience, he's entitled to protection 
and that the children of aliens born in this state are considered natural born subjects and have the same rights with the rest of the citizens. But subjects are not citizens. And we fought wars so that we could be transformed from subjects of the British crown to citizens of the Republic. Now, the people I just quoted don't know what they're talking about, but I'll tell you the truth and I'll prove it. We first address words definitions because word meanings change throughout time. Let me give you some examples. The word awful once meant full of wonder and reverence. It didn't mean bad. It didn't mean disgusting. It meant full of wonder and reverence. The word cute used to mean bow-legged. If you said someone was cute, that means they were bow-legged. And as most of you probably know, gay used to meant jovial, happy. The word nice used to mean precise, not nice as in the way we look at nice now. So accordingly, if someone from an earlier time wrote an article and said he was a cute gay man, he was not referring to an adorable homosexual, but to a cheerful, bow-legged man. You see, so in order to understand the genuine meaning of the text, we must use the definitions that the authors used when they wrote it. Otherwise, written text becomes a shifting and impermanent as the clouds, just blowing here and there throughout the years by those who unthinkingly read it in their own uninformed understanding, or they deliberately pervert the text to fit their agenda. What words meant then is not the same as what words mean now. So is our Constitution built on the rock of fixed definitions? They're fixed on the definitions our framers used. So when Walker quotes the 1795 decision of natural-born subject to prove that anyone here is a natural-born citizen, what did our founding fathers mean by natural-born citizen? Article 2, U.S. Constitution, requires that the president be a natural-born citizen. The meaning of this term is set forth in the Constitution or in the Federalist Papers, and there's no discussion of the meaning of Madison's Journal and the Federal Convention or in Alexander Hamilton's notes about the same. Well, what does this tell us? that they all knew what it meant. We don't go around defining pizza because every American over the age of four knows what a pizza is. Our framing fathers had no need to define natural born citizen in the Constitution because by the time of the Federal Convention in 1789, a formal definition of the term consistent with the new Republican principles already existed in Vattel's classic Law of Nations. And we know that our fathers carefully studied and rely on Vittel's work. And I'll prove that. During 1775, Charles Dumas, an ardent Republican, not from the Republican Party, Republican as in opposed to a monarchist, living in Europe, sent three copies of Vittel's Law of Nations to Benjamin Franklin. Here's a portion of Franklin's letter on December 9, 1775, thanking Dumas for the book. And he said, and I quote, I am much obliged by the kind present you have made us of your edition of Vittel. It comes to us in good season, when the circumstances of a rising state make it necessary frequently to consult the law of nations. Accordingly, that copy, which I kept, after depositing one in our own public library here, and sending the other to the College of Massachusetts Bay, as you directed, has been continually in the hands of the members of Congress now sitting, who are much pleased with your notes and preference, and have entertained a high and just esteem for their author. Well, Vittel's Law of Nations was thereafter pounced upon by studious members of Congress groping their way without the light of precedence. Well, in later years, Albert Lapardelle wrote an introduction to the 1916 edition of Law of Nations, published by the Carnegie Endowment. He said the Fathers of Independence were in accordance with the idea of Vittel. They found in Vittel all of their maxims of political liberty. And, from 1776 to 1783. The more the United States progressed, the greater became Vettel's influence. In 1780, his Law of Nations was a classic, 
It was a textbook in universities. And in a footnote on that same page, it said another copy presented by Franklin to the Liberty Company of Philadelphia among the records of its dictators in the following minute. October 10th, 1775. Dumas, having presented the library with a very late edition of Vattel's Law of Nations in French, the board direct the secretary to return the gentlemen their thanks. The copy undoubtedly was used by the members of the Second Continental Congress, which sat in Philadelphia, by the leading men who directed the policy of the United Colonies until the end of the war, and, later, by the men who sat in Convention of 1787 and drew up the Constitution of the United States. For the library was located at Carpenter's Hall, where the first Congress deliberated, and within a stone's throw of the Continental State House of Pennsylvania, where the second Congress met, and likewise near where the Constitution was framed. So Vettel's work was, quote-unquote, continually in the hands of Congress in 1775. Members of the Continental Congress pounced on Vettel's work. Our founders used the Republican principles in Vettel's work to justify our revolution against a monarchy. And that's important because by 1780, Vitale's work was classically taught in our universities. Our framers used it at the federal convention in 1787. Now here's what Vitale says on natural born citizens, inhabitants, and naturalized citizens. And this is important. From our beginning, we were subjects of the British crown. With the War for Independence, we became citizens. We needed new concepts to fit our new status as citizens. See, there was a status change between subjects and citizens. Vettel provided these new Republican concepts of citizenship, the gist of what Vettel says in the Law of Nations. It says on page 212, Natural-born citizens are those born in the country of parents who are citizens. It's necessary that they be born of a father who is a citizen. If a person is born there of a foreigner, it will be only the place of his birth and not his country. Inhabitants, as distinguished from citizens, are foreigners who are permitted to stay in this country. They're subject to the laws of the country while they reside in it, but they do not participate in all of the rights of citizens. They enjoy only the advantages with the law or custom gives them. Their children follow the conditions of their fathers. They, too, are inhabitants. Page 214 says, A country may grant to a foreigner the quality of citizen. This is naturalization. In some countries, the sovereign cannot grant to a foreigner all of the rights of a citizen, such as that holding of public office. This is a regulation of the fundamental law. As in England, merely being born in the country naturalizes the children of a foreigner. Children born of citizens in a foreign country at sea or while overseas in the service of their country are citizens by the law of nature alone. Children follow the condition of their fathers. The place of birth produces no change in this particular. That means if your parents are not citizens, natural-born citizens, then you are naturalized, not natural-born. Do you see? The republic concept of natural-born citizenship is radically different from the feudal notion of naturally-born subjects. Under federalism, merely being born in the domains of the king made one by birth a natural-born subject. But in Vitell's model and our constitutional republic, citizens are natural born only if they are born of citizens. If your parents are not citizens, then you're not a citizen. Here is how our framers applied Vitell's concept of natural born citizen in our constitution. The federal convention was in session May 14th through September 17th of 1787. John Jay who had been a member of the Continental Congress, sent this letter of July 25, 1787, to George Washington, who presided over the convention. He said, Permit me to hint 
whether it would not be wise and seasonable to provide a strong check to the admission of foreigners into the administration of our national government and declare expressly that the commander-in-chief of the American army shall not be given to nor devolve on any but a natural-born citizen. According to Article 2, it says no person except a natural-born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible for the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. Vattel states that fundamental law may withhold from naturalized citizens some of the rights of citizens, such as holding public office. The Constitution is our fundamental law. Following Vattel's Article 2, it withholds from naturalized citizen, except for our founding fathers who were grandfathered in, the right to hold the office of president. Now remember, none of our early presidents were national-born citizens, even though they were all born here. How can that be? They were all born as subjects of the British crown. They became nationalized citizen with the Declaration of Independence. This is why it was necessary to provide a grandfather clause for them. But after our founding father's generation was gone, their successors were required to be born as citizens of the United States, not merely born here, as were our founders, but born as citizens. So, do you see, if our framers understood that merely being born here was sufficient to confer a status of a national-born citizen, it wouldn't have been necessary to grandfather in our first generation of presidents. Dave Ramsey was a historian, founding father, and member of the Continental Congress. Now remember, this is the Continental Congress where they used Vattel's Law of Nations, whose dissertation on the manner of requiring the character and privileges of a citizen of the United States was published in 1789, just after ratification of our Constitution and the year the new government began. It's an interesting dissertation. And it's only eight pages long. At the bottom of page six, Ramsey says this, The citizenship of no man could be previous to the Declaration of Independence, and as a natural right belong to none but those who have been born of citizens since July 4th, 1776. So do you see Ramsey's dissertation sets forth the understanding of the time formally stated by Vattel's and incorporated by our framers that a natural-born citizen is one who is born of citizens, and we had no citizens before July 4th, 1776. So let's look at the First Congress. How did the First Congress follow Vattel and our framers? Well, Article 1 delegates to Congress the power to establish and inform the rule of naturalization. Pursuant to the power, the first Congress passed the Naturalization Act of 1790. Here's the text. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that any alien who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for the term of two years may be admitted to become a citizen thereof. An application of any common law court of record in any one of the states wherein he shall have resided for the term of one year at least, making proof of the satisfaction of such court that he is a person of good character, taking the oath of affirmation prescribed by law to support the Constitution of the United States, which oath or affirmation such court shall administer, and the clerk of such court shall record such application, and the proceedings thereon, and thereupon such person shall be considered as a citizen of the United States, and the children of such person shall be naturalized, dwelling within the United States, being under the age of 21 years at the time of such naturalization, shall also be considered as citizens of the United States." And the children of citizens of the United States that may be born beyond sea or out of the limits of the United States shall be considered as natural-born citizens, provided 
that the right of citizenship shall not descend to persons whose fathers have never been resident in the United States. Let me say that again. That the right of citizenship shall not descend to persons whose fathers have never been residents of the United States. So, this act of the first Congress implements the principles set forth in Vattel, embraced by our founding fathers and enshrined in Article 2. A natural born citizen is one who is born of parents who are citizens. Minor children born here of aliens do not become citizens until their parents are naturalized. Thus, they are not natural born citizens. Our framers rejected the anti-republican and feudal notion that mere location of birth within a country nationalizes the children of a foreigner. The distinction written into our Constitution and implemented by the Naturalization Act of 1790 is between someone who is born a citizen by being born of parents who are already citizen, someone who becomes a citizen after birth by naturalization, only the former are eligible to be president. So original intent? or whatever the people with the power want it to mean. We cannot redefine our constitution to fit somebody's political desires. So let me ask you this. If you went to the doctor and the doctor said, I'm sorry, you have cancer, this is gonna be fatal. And you say, well, doc, I want you to go back and change the way that you diagnose cancer because I won't be able to get insurance if I have cancer. So redesign the way that you do this to make it look like or make it sound like I don't have cancer so I can get life insurance before I die from this. You can't change the way a doctor diagnoses cancer just so that you can get life insurance. Along those same lines, we cannot change our constitution so that people like Obama or Rubio can run and become president because neither one of these people are eligible. Barack Obama's father was never a citizen of the United States and his mother cannot confer citizenship by her alone. In order to be a natural born citizen, in order to run for president, you have to be born of two citizens. The mother and the father have to be a citizen. Now you can feel free to pull out your list of excuses or pull out your list of rationalizations and say, but this or but that, but I just told you what the constitution itself says, the way that it's defined. That's the bottom line. Now, if you want to change it and still live a, a delusion, that's going to be up to you. And you can feel free to email me at contact at wdeanshook.com. Thank you for sticking with me through this conversation. I appreciate it all very, very much. And as usual, when the dust settles and the smoke clears, I'll be back with more Truth in the News. See you on our next episode. Thank you. You can get these full stories and more at wdeanshook.com. That's wdeanshook.com.